Hello and welcome to the Chilled Cardano podcast. We have a special episode for you guys today interviewing the Opus DAO team. We'll have Davis, Will, Chris, and Cody. They'll be on to talk about their fractionalizing of physical NFT marketplace. We talked to them a little bit last week, but their founder, Chris, wasn't on. So we wanted to do like a full length podcast because they have some really interesting things to tell us. You guys will see our conversation with them, but it's really interesting. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, we had a nice little conversation with them and and the whole macroeconomic environment as well as the nitty gritty of their project and how things work. And we asked them a lot of tough questions and I think they did a really good job of answering those. And we're really excited to present this video for you guys. If you guys are missing us talking about the charts, we understand, but we'll be here next week for you to tell you that we're still in a bear market. So <laughs> <laughs> without further ado, guys, enjoy. I am here with the Opus DAO members and my co-host, Mike. I'm Eric. How are you guys doing today? Great. Just having a relaxed Saturday. Doing great. Feeling real chill. Awesome. Awesome. Um, before we start, I think it'd be, I mean, we kind of had you guys on last week, but I think it'd be good to like, just everyone do a quick introduction so everyone knows like what your, uh, part of the project is and and everything like that so maybe we'll start with chris all right hey so hey i'm chris dozinski some of you may know me as neighborhood ape from my main account on twitter but i am the founder of opus dow i am the one who conceptualized it all and kind of had this um theory that we could bring these physical assets on chain and from there this is where this all kind of birthed from and I've uh, gathered this team that we have together now, along with many more that we don't have in front of us right now. And we're collectively building this together. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to uh, meet you. Dave, thank you. Davis, you want to go next? Sure. So my role is basically project facilitation, strategic planning, and trying to get as many companies on board with Opus as possible to help it grow. Awesome. Uh, Cody? Yeah, so uh, my, my uh, role so far has been uh, very much so on the media side. And so I've been doing a lot of the, the, the logo kickers and all the things like that that you, you, you guys have seen. And other than that, I'm kind of just um, holding the thing together. Wherever this stuff's needed that uh, they need to get done, I could try to go ahead and get that done. You're the glue. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> nice. Uh, and Will? Uh, yeah, so um, the firm Davis mentioned earlier, that's actually uh, our strategic advisory firm. So we kind of specialize in handling projects that have more of an uncharted course without a, a definitive blueprint of emerging markets, things like that. Um, this is something kind of right up our alley with the technology and digital transfer, uh, transformation aspects. Uh, aspects. But uh, I'm certainly the most novice out of the group. So um uh, I'm just kind of an avid learner at this point, just trying to listen to everything and absorb as much as possible. Sounds good. Very nice. Guys, what is a DAO? Let's start there. For anybody listening who has never even heard the word, like, what is it? So basically, a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization, and that just means that is any group of people that decide to get together for any reasoning being from they want to say collect a piece of art together collectively to whether they want to actually form and run a business together collectively this is the way that we believe the future will be ran is a network of DAOs and all of them kind of running around and being very decentralized and having the capabilities for anybody to come in and join and actually help the project along so that is the basic rundown of a DAO. And why do you think that's like a better way to set up a company than a centralized like NFT marketplace or something like that? Well, decentralization is key in crypto. So like that's one of the reasons why we chose Cardano. We understand the decentralization and how they plan on fully decentralizing or decentralizing the Cardano blockchain. And we have kind of used that template and molded this from that 
along with some of the other platforms that we've seen be very successful using a DAO structure. We believe this is where everything is kind of shifting towards because everybody gets to say, they get their vote, they get to create proposals and actually be a part of the whole ride as opposed to just being somebody on the sideline that doesn't have a chance to get in or has to miss an opportunity. Um, we really believe that this is how things will be built in the near future. And we want to be one of the first use cases in a sense. There's many other use cases, don't get me wrong, but we want to be one of the first powerful use cases on Cardano to show, hey, we could actually build great things here. And you think what you think um, that'll set you apart as far as other NFT marketplaces? What I believe actually sets us apart from other NFT marketplaces is that we're we already looking into the physical asset of things. We understand NFTs are really just um, verification on the blockchain and the ability to transfer that verification of ownership of assets. So the fact that we were looking into these uh, physical collectibles such as trading cards, real estate, auto care, and all of these other industries, we believe we're going to get a nice portion of all of those traditionally illiquid markets. And we are going to focus on trying to make these markets liquid and have the ability to trade in and out of said assets. And that is why I believe this will set Opus. This is why I believe Opus will be different from other DAOs or other marketplaces in a sense. Most marketplaces that have this similar mindset right now, you can't get a place in early. You know, there is no round for you to jump in on. Um, we want to be the DAO and that marketplace that allows the users to come in from the first step, basically. Uh, we want all the users to come in on the first step and help us build together collectively. And that's why I believe this will be the best marketplace on Cardano, first of all. But to move past that, I think because we are trying to get this piece of each of these markets is what I really think will solidify us for the future. Yeah. So when these these people they they uh, buy into the the different um, tokens that we have, and at that point they 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 are giving us the ability to start the beginning for them, and and we are going to be able to uh, take that and um, use it to to help them have a place to go with way more tools, way more things than all these other marketplaces are going to have. Um, I believe that once the people understand and that they're putting their money or their power of choosing to help us into it, then they'll get, they'll, they'll, um, then we'll be able to finally push forward and, and be able to build, start building with, with their help. Because again, if we, we don't have their help, we're we're uh, only at a, a certain point. One thing I do want to mention is like how you were saying like a DAO NFT marketplace, right? So if you guys are familiar with Ethereum, you're familiar with Looks Rare and what they did earlier this year, right? And how yeah. they kind of dropped all their tokens and they um, decentralized their marketplace, right? There was still a bunch of VCs in on that first investment yeah. round. So when that token shot up, those VCs were able to cash out. Yeah, you understand. So this is something that doesn't really help decentralization. It's really not to call it a pump and dump because I don't truly believe that is what looks rare is, to be honest. But the fact that it gives the opportunity to be posed as that, I think, is a negative look. And that's not the way that I believe you should start business. I believe you start business as the ground floor and allow everybody to have that opportunity, especially if it is a doubt. You know, I, I feel we the way that we are starting this and raising everything together from the ground floor with everybody, everybody who is here from the early community, they're going to really see what we built together because they're going to be along the entire ride, you know, so making, you guys, making boats and actually creating the ways that we function within this now, you know, so that you will further be trans transparent as possible with the community from the jump. Uh, Absolutely. Like that is the main thing in building a DAO. You need to be very transparent. That's why our, that's why all of our information is out there on our DAO, on our website, everything that we have shown. That's why our faces right here on screen, you know, everything that we can show to be transparent, we want to show to be transparent because we believe this will one benefit the business, but also this will help 
decentralization. And I feel, or we all really feel that if we could build this together collectively properly, then I really think we will be a case study in a sense and other amazing things will grow from this, not just us. They will take our model and then grow that model. And then we'll see the next big marketplace possibly it'll using it. will help the name of Cardano, it'll help the name of blockchain, it will help mm-hmm. all of those if we can figure out what we truly want to do in the long run and put those um, different types of assets on chain. And as a strategic advisory firm, we can ensure that those assets make their way onto the Opus marketplace, considering that we have quite a few subsidiaries in development and a few existing relationships with other companies. And uh, just to chime in on that note, um, that, that's actually a good point to bring up part of the structure where um, it's adding some unclarity because we're trying to really do something a little bit different. And um, what some might not call the, the smartest idea and uh, what we've been told so far by some of our advisors regarding the way the DAO is structured, where it really is just completely community focused. And uh, part of how we're trying to do that is by opening up the early initial, what would be considered normally a private investment round in most businesses similar to this, similar um, fundraising uh, activity in the industry has been normally done privately to only accredited investors. So we're doing our best at the current moment to offer this to almost anyone that sees the same value in what we're trying to accomplish, which is at best a um, kind of a standard setting um, kind of authority uh, I don't want to say uh, like for the right way of doing this as far as uh, from a business ethics and moral hazard standpoint, but as best as possible with general financial principles in mind and trying to blend the, both, the best of both worlds here as best as, uh, you know, any one organization can. And that's really why we tried to partner with who we feel are some of the best partners we could find in the industry and uh, bring it all together here. So uh, Personally happy, uh, Chris and Cody here decided to involve our firm in the project and um, personally happy myself to be able to help and contribute towards it. So it um, it seems like we're off to a good start and um, just because the nature of kind of this new uncharted frontier here, we're um, just trying to be as certain as possible what we're doing is above board and uh, kind of has foresight for the future regulations and things like that. And, uh, I know we're really early in the process of this, um, but how do you guys plan on vetting real world auctioneers? So right now our partner Diamond Service Grading, they are actually a grading card company out of California. So we are looking for partners like this that are already reputable and in their business or in their industry and specific to their industry to partner with these types of partnerships and grow the business in that sense. So we can look through the different types of um, sites like uh, Better Business Bureau and get get an idea of how they already look already look on on um, on paper, and we can also then take a look at so if, me in general uh, on the line and and be able to uh, our, have a good time. Our firm specializes in uh, due diligence and essentially um, it, a pretty extensive level of vetting for high-level executive projects and uh, generally crisis management areas when things go wrong is unfortunately a lot of times we get brought into the situation. So the um, need for an absolute, sorry, background noise here. You did yourself. But it's a little bit better. Uh, so um, essentially the necessity to have the information that we're providing be absolutely accurate and um, finite and delivered in a really quickly, timely fashion. Um, we feel we can easily vet the individuals in this industry just through different things like Lexus, Nexus, Bell's Link, and other protocols that are available to private business entities at the moment. And then, so like, since um, you're going to have NFT DAOs, will those participants be able to vote on like third party auctioneers or is that solely going to be done by the team? I think that would be something we're probably in the process of currently figuring out with the uh, people that are much more intelligent with all of that and our compliance team at the moment as far as how all that would work and at what point the DAO would be brought in for a vote versus things that would have to be done internally for operational efficiency standpoint. 
We yeah, so gradually decentralizing this. In the beginning, we would need to have a bit more control considering that we're paying some of the companies involved to build this. So we just need to give the DAO a direction and a structure before we can hand it off to the voters. Similar to Bell's system, uh, the original cell, or, uh, telephone when it was first created, how the founder, Alexander Graham Bell, was, I'm not even sure, ever involved in the corporation that ended up earning the patent. Mm. Side of his father in law was kind of the one that really brought it to the public. And if I'm not mistaken, also kind of just disappeared from the spotlight of it very quickly. Um, and it was more or less ran by a um, faceless corporation, and we see how well that all turned out, um, as we're all probably talking on Verizon and AT and T communication devices. So we want to try to avoid that by doing it as methodically and correctly from the beginning as possible, and then going from there. And then, how will the voting be done on Opus DAO? Is it going to be every going to everything going to be like done in like on the website, or are you guys using a different website or Discord or like, what are you guys thinking? Where's your, what's your vision for like, where are all the communities gonna be taking place in the discussions? So at the very beginning, uh, all the proposals and all that will be held in Discord. We will be using a bot to verify that you have the asset and that your vote is weighted in that um, manner. But after we actually get the governance token and all that, we are actually working with um, Summon platform from ADAO and they're, working to create the whole backend that will allow us to actually vote on chain and use our tokens for uh, actual voting on chain and all the proposals, nice. everything will be there. That is estimated quarter four of this year, but obviously with updates, we will keep the community updated as well. And then what is the difference between the Dow Genesis NFT and the governance NFT? So the Genesis NFT is a governance NFT. All three of the NFTs that we do have, those are, like we said in the first part, those will be weighted to however many NFTs you have in your wallet, and then we'll vote in that manner. But once we actually do the airdrop uh, of our governance tokens in the future, that is uh, all accumulated due to whichever NFT you do have. If you look on our site, each, um, each of the three NFTs, they all have different amounts to be airdropped in the future. So that is the one difference between the three uh, NFTs that we do have available right now. Only one is currently for sale. And then as that one sells out, the next two will be available in, in order. And then um, so the main difference right now is just basically the airdrop from that governance token. And then besides that, everything else is the same. Uh, what role does MLabs play in your partnerships? They are the developers. They are the ones that will actually help us write all the code and get everything actually on chain, write all the smart contracts to be able to operate this uh, marketplace itself. They're doing our we're slowly. We're slowly elaborating more, um, and we plan to kind of do a slow, not stealthy, intentionally, but more methodical launch of all of that information as it develops and more concrete. Um, it's now currently up on our about us page where it has a little bit more of a description on what each partner's role is and um, a little bit more about each partner with links to their uh, uh, their respective websites and uh, it hopefully will just elaborate on that as the uh, kind of partnerships form in more of a cohesive way and we kind of concrete these roles what uh, the roles that every individual within those companies is playing on the project. Correct. And we chose M Labs because we truly believe in them. We've seen what they have done with Sunday Swap, Jero, and many other countless projects on Cardano already. So we definitely believe in them because everything they have done has been near golden. So um, we truly believe we have picked the best teams to actually make this come to life. And, and we have dimensionally already with our mint. And uh, that was their good show of faith that they really are just committed. And it was kind of uh, without even having to ask, really, they just kind of involved with the support and help uh, in any way possible, even outside what they're contractually obligated to. Which was, uh, an unusual experience coming from the traditional business world and uh, quite uh, a, a nice one to start. What, uh, what's the best way to, to follow your project? Do you guys want people on Twitter, Discord, or your website? The website is really where all the information is held. You could always come into our Discord and ask us personally any questions you'd like to know more about the project. We're always in there. We're always chatting with the community, trying to let everybody know what's going on. Twitter is really the main feed of the day-to-day, -day, 
but our Twitter feed goes directly to our Discord. So whichever, wherever you're at, you're going to get that information. And the website is really the landing page that allows you to actually see what we're building. Then you can go and check out that white paper and that full white paper that we have that actually goes into detail of everything that we're planning on doing with the community. Nice. I also plan on posting Davis's address up for any people that have any complaints with the project as well. <laughs> I'll be glad to meet them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then this, uh, as well as um, the last page on there is you, you can actually just see the actual um, address where you send your ADA to and you can mint the tokens. And, and we plan uh, on elaborating more on each token as we develop a more concrete usage of them and any more form. Uh, future, sorry, tokens or uh, anything related to the tokenomics of the entirety and ecosystem we're planning on. So um, yeah, hopefully it'll kind of spider web in more of a uh, mind mapping way as the website develops and it'll, its sole purpose will be more of an informative kind of project, um, you know, project updates, things like that, um, and a communication board for the time being until we have the more permanent application available. But in the meantime, it, as I see it, it would be a good place to have all the information, a gay giant living white papers, et cetera. Eric, you're going to say So do you guys have, uh, yeah. Um, do you guys have like an estimated date on when you would want to like launch an NFT marketplace of your own? We're aiming for the July 4th of, of 2023. Yeah, awesome. next well, we have estimates from all of our partners for how long the scope of the work will actually take. Um, with that, we could estimate sometime quarter one, most likely probably quarter two now at this point of next year is really most likely a fully launched date. I think the test net date was more so Q1. Awesome. So if, if people want to mint the NFTs right now, it would definitely help in that process of getting that marketplace launched and everything absolutely like we said we're building everything with the community directly so this is going to help get us to that position to be able to actually build this out with them labs and with all the other teams we have lined up yeah this first round of, of stuff that would be going out would, would put us into a position to give um all those guys the pretty much for lack of better words down payments to get them started and get them going and then from there, we will just keep on and keep showing what they're doing and building. And it should keep on with the community. Seeing it get bigger should help us grow from there. And when we actually get to that building phase with our partners, that's when the proposals of how and what exactly we're going to do within the DAO will be a little bit more uh, structured because that's when we'll actually have that feedback. Right now, as a founders team, we have a, an outline per se, but we really want to um, consult the community first before we have anything in um, in concrete. And uh, to be honest, that's the real reason why we're um, kind of passively trying to advertise. We're trying to give the community as much access into this as possible. We already have private investment uh, firms that we traditionally work with as our strategic advisor from lined up that have uh, kiddingly, annoyingly been interested in the project because the private investment industry is lacking any real barrier. In fact, uh, there's a huge barrier to entry because they there's just um, very unuseful tensions in between people. And, and uh, it's kind of funny. Both sides have a little bit of hurt feelings and um, are having difficulty mending it. So it um, seems like we might be able to provide a bit of a bridge of a gap there, but we're really hoping this can be open to the community as long as humanly possible before we have to bring them in just for the sake of development speed and not missing that deadline. Part, so. And that is the difference between the three NFTs. Yeah. So we have the original that we're selling now, um, the Obsidian, that you will get X amount. And then we have the two other ones, Golden and Rubidium, and those are lesser amounts that you will get airdropped. But as we actually grow the DAO and we, the way that we plan on growing the DAO is with these same NFTs and staking them over four year period. Mm -hmm. And as you stake all of your NFTs, no matter which one it is, you will receive the same reward for staking. The only difference is the airdrop for the governance token. And are you Alleged. like uh, bringing ADAO in to like, basically is that, do you feel like that's like the best ADA, like DAO community right now? Or like, is, is there other projects that you see it that like 
They are the DAO community in Cardano. They are the ones actually creating the tools. So what we plan on doing is helping them and helping fund them to create better tools for all the DAOs collectively on Cardano. We're already in communications with RASDAO and a couple other, you know, smaller DAOs like that, trying to make partnerships to say, work with ADAO, because we're already currently working with a uh, summon platform, which is by ADAO to be exact, but um, we're now collectively chatting as DAO communities to try to figure out how to help ADAO build all these things collectively. So we already have them on board to help us, you know, build certain things, but now we want to be able to share all of these things that they build together to the community. And obviously more of us is better than just one community, you know, gathering these funds together to build all these things that everybody will find useful. And we're currently planning on creating a separate company to help other companies bring their assets on chain. Awesome. Do you guys think there's enough of community on Cardano to sp specifically do it here? And would you ever reach out to other chains to try to bring them in as well, like through a bridge so, or something of that nature? So, yeah, we're, we're starting with Cardano because this is where we believe the um, transactions will happen on, correct? So in the future, what I truly believe is interoperability. I've been saying interoperability since last August, I want to say with NFTs and with other chains in general. Like we already know about Milkomedia and other cross-chain opportunities that we now have currently. And that's just the beginning. There's gonna be so many other cross-chains to Polkadot, to, to every cross-chain most likely. We will probably experience this, but we understand that the cheap transaction fees of Cardano is a major component to building a marketplace that will be used by the world. Because for instance, when I first got into trading NFTs, I couldn't really afford the the transaction fees on Ethereum. So that kind of drove me, drove me away from just trading NFTs on Ethereum. That kind of introduced me to the early Cardano NFT community. That's when I was minting um, CBITs and um, all this other fun stuff very early on, minting my own NFTs at that same time frame, right? So this is when I really started to dive into all this and really start to understand that uh, Cardano is going to be that transaction layer chain and then all a lot of other cross chains will connect with this and probably uh, result their transactions on this chain. Yes, we see that with one chain too. M Labs is helping develop that. We also see the EVM side chain coming with the Vassal hard fork soon on Cardano. What are your thoughts Thank on you. the hard fork? Do you guys want to talk about that uh, at all? Or my thoughts on the hard fork is uh, we definitely need it. This is, from my understanding, is going to help a lot with the throughput. And that is definitely one thing that I know we need on Cardano. I remember trading back in January when JPEG store was just kind of opening up and we had CNFT, right? And um, yeah. everybody was trying to trade at that time period. You know, all these hot projects came out and everybody was trying to trade and the chain got way too congested. So it took you know, an hour for certain transactions to go through. These are the certain things that we need to actually make Cardano a competitive blockchain with the rest of the other blockchains in the world. The fact that it's cheap is great, but not everybody wants to wait a long time for their actual transactions. So the fact that this, um, this um, hard fork is actually going to help this throughput, I really believe this is going to just make us further in that limelight and let everybody know hey we're actually here to build longevity not just be around and be cheap and be a smaller chain we really want that market share so i really think this will actually help benefit that what are your thoughts about the delays like do you think that hurts the community at all or like do you think i think the delays are away? good because they prevent us from running into issues my one thing with cardano is build slow because Everybody else who's built things fast and broken things, they've kind of gotten into either legal trouble or had some type of hack happen with their platform. And this is the last thing that we want on Cardano as a community. We are really trying to build things right here. And um, not the slower, the better, but the safer, the better is, is my uh, method. So if it's going to take us a little bit longer to make things safer, then I think that's the right way to go. As the uh, Chinese culture uh, says, uh, think not how your actions today affect your tomorrow, but how it affects your grandkids tomorrow, essentially. So I essentially probably butcher the quote in a eloquent way, but uh, yeah. I like it. Very insightful. Um, question about like the, I guess the traditional investment world. Do people, when you talk about Cardano to like those kind of people, do they 
Do they know about it or just kind of It's interesting like- because a lot of these firms seem to be deep into Bitcoin, but they're not sure exactly how to approach NFTs at this time or other so crypto. Either if they're aware of the space at all and uh, a particular member or partner has a strong interest in getting into it, um, where they've done any bit of their own research and it was from self-interest, it, it, they generally do know Cardano and they are aware that it is one of the leading platforms to start looking into. Um, most of those people were aware of that already, but it seems to be that a lot of other people just from the analysts that they've paid a lot of money to go do research and figure this all out um, are now starting to actually come back with the answer as Cardano being the real NFT kind of powerhouse. So that's also pretty exciting. And uh, at least from my point of view, I thought it was yeah. a bit of an affirmation we were choosing the right platform to start with. It Especially almost- given the Marlowe financial contracts that Cardano was building with IOG. Precisely. A lot of the times so it was like a lot of people looked into Cardano, but they didn't really keep up with this. So when they looked into it, say a year or two years ago, it wasn't there yet. So now every time we do communicate with some of these um, projects, firms or whatever it may be, we are actually educating them on some of these things. And then every time they come back to us, with some of the resources that we educated them on, they're always very shocked and understanding of, oh, wow, this is a powerhouse. This is something for the future. And we need to really start paying attention to it. Yeah, I was going to say that this like technology is so powerful. And like, especially when you start using it yourself, you get a, you get a, you get a hot wallet like a NAMI Eternal and you start using it. But for somebody who's not as um, techie, how do you bring somebody on who really doesn't understand the space and especially coming like not even from Bitcoin, but just in general, like what, what do you think the best way of onboarding these people are who are just absolutely new to this space? Well, the one thing that I think is going to make it um, the best possible outcome and for the future for that is going to be when we as a community start putting more time into making it uh, user friendly instead of the way that it's set up now. We um, and I believe that we as Opus are going to try to implement a lot of that, but that's um, that's really said for the future and if the uh, DAO is in agreement. Another big thing to talk digital. I would also another thing I want to let me yes. talk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I want to talk on is um the fact that uh oh man you guys made me forget what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> Quick <laughs> while you remember I, I edit, the, I edit the other out, yeah. part of uh, the other part of the education thing was um I know we've all discussed in previous meetings but I think we haven't had a real chance to concrete it. I would assume it's probably something we need some other uh, of our partners help with but. I do believe we want to kind of create a more of a recording of the processes we take as we develop this so that we can kind of streamline it to more of a guidebook, protocols, things like that, how to tutorials and create it almost, um, I would say, ancillary, like educational tool that goes along with the marketplace. So as users enter into going to get more into the complexity of everything to do with NFTs, they can have correlating educational resources as well. What I also, what I now remember what I want to talk about, what I want to talk about was use case. So that's my biggest thing when it comes to actually onboarding users. What's the use case really? So are people really out here trading DeFi coins? Are they actually trading NFTs? What's the popularity behind that? Cool. All right. There's X amount of numbers in both of those fields. And that's kind of the limit to that for now. But what's the real thing that I think will bring users to the platform is use case. And when I say that, I mean, the trading cards, we already understand the numbers of collectible users in the world. There is millions of collectibles in this world and collectible holders. And we believe trading cards is one of those assets that almost everybody kind of has some trading card in their basement, in their closet, whatever it may be, right? So this is what kind of all this uh, stemmed from was the fact that uh, I have two good buddies that actually trade trading cards and they make decent money. So that when I realized that, I was like, huh, I have a couple of trading cards. How can we actually make these physical trading cards into NFTs and represent them on the blockchain? This is where it all kind of started about a year and a quarter, maybe a little bit over that. And from there, this is my crazy idea is being able to bring these physical assets on chain and actually giving a use case to the blockchain by 
being able to represent physical assets in the real world on chain, fractionalize them and then prove the ownership, I believe that is use case. And that is what I truly believe will help onboard millions and millions of users, whether it's from real estate, whether it's from trading cards, from whatever collectible there, you could choose so many. And once they actually do get privy to the blockchain NFTs and the technology that's available, they're going to start to notice, wow, Ethereum is very expensive. Maybe I should look into Cardano or some of the other blockchains. And that's where our market share will come in. Is that the market you're going at first? Is like, where are you guys putting the most attention to right now? Is it is it trading cards or like, I know you're talking about houses as well. And re- yes. So the first use case is the trading cards because that's where our direct partners are, Diamond Service Grading, and we are partnering with them. So they're encapsulating service. Uh, once they actually grade the trading cards, they will also have a QR code on the actual trading card itself that will represent that trading card on the blockchain as an NFT. So they're actually creating an NFT encasing um, system that will be directly tied in with us. This is kind of our um, first first run at this to prove that this is possible, to prove that there is real life assets and we could actually bring it onto Cardano and fractionalize and do all these fun things. From there, we're already in uh, talks with other companies to try to partner with them to use their resources or however they could you know, bring their assets onto the blockchain. We want to be that company that helps bridge their assets to the blockchain. So just like we've explained to you, the trading cards is the first step. We've explained to them they're also paying attention very closely. And once we prove that this is all possible, we already have a couple other things in the pipeline. So uh, just to add to that, the three uh, Davis mentioned earlier, why we know at least um, we can bring the Opus platform to uh, you know market strong, at least from the real estate and the automotive standpoint. We have two big projects internally that we've been working on for one, five years, well, 2016, and uh, the other one about seven to eight, or I'm sorry, uh, 2017, 2018. And uh, both are just about at the phase where they're hopefully going to have somewhat of a national saturation level in the next maybe one to two years at the most. Um, we have pretty aggressive marketing campaigns, and we went about it more of a, uh, I, I don't want to say startup build, but more of the ecosystem build where um, kind of aligning everything. So once we had started, it's kind of smooth sailing from there we already kind of know the directionality everything currently is taken care of um where a lot of the times funding outside is one of the bigger roadblocks um so as far as our plans for the opus project having those backups in place in case there is issues with markets it's currently being in bear cycle like it is now it kind of makes it so um it can be hard to grow a project that has a lot of value if particular users don't um see it gaining a lot of value i think uh what's the new phrase um uh say no uh the promo i think it's the fc or the fcc is trying to uh coin so um not not really that great but uh no no go to fomo that's what it is uh even more of a millennial term so yeah it's uh funny but um so i I, in, in that uh pursuit we're hoping that we can kind of help stabilize a lot of that by adding traditional gray line rule methodology kind of deterrence and uh place where not that there would be a actual penalty but the um risk exposure is never that great to cause someone to want to sell or cause market volatility and vice versa the mitigation practice is in place to um, stop someone from being able to cause things just like the dow system in general um keeping a particular board or group of individuals from kind of steering this in the wrong direction that is a community focus. Um, to kind of back up that and guarantee that, um, one of our other holdings happens to be a dual authentication um, software protocol that, from what I've been told, is the only patent pending protocol that uh, currently is available. Um, it's developed from government and military spec security um, interfaces for real world application to the digital so in other words like being able to cross reference your fingerprint with the database and internal like id protocols and stuff or um trade of assets uh chain of custody of assets and um personnel things like that so hopefully that should be able to help a lot yeah no it did thank you so much 
Um, I'm really interested in the trading card idea as far as like if we can get into it a little bit more like so like walk me through it like so let's say somebody buys a card in in the real world is this like what we're talking about like and it, it's, it's yeah, worth so, a lot does that does who who holds oh, yeah. the card the physical like, say, card? like so, i have a honus wagner card for yeah. example so you would take your honus wagner card you would then send it into uh dsg gradings um and uh they would they would then uh do the the grading of the card first um and they would give you a grade from one to ten based on their grading system and then they would encapsulate it in our encapsulation that is currently being made that not only has the nft attached to it but it also has a couple of other things that will be attaching to it for um insurance and security reasons and then um from there, it will be sent back to you with uh, all of the the, the different attachments uh, on it and ready to go that you can look it up right on the blockchain, look it up right on um, Opus DAO. And also, we'll have access to Diamond Service Gradings software, which will allow you to have a preliminary grading of the card to determine whether or not it's worth an encapsulation. And then gotcha. so from there, you have this card and then you can fractionalize it at some point if you wanted to? Or how Correct. Would that work? So, yeah, so the fractionalization will work is like, so you have the Wagner card, right? You would yeah. go and get that graded with us um, or with the diamond service grading that goes and returns to you. Once it gets returned to you, then you could come onto our platform and fractionalize it. You would keep that 51% since you're actually physically holding that card. Okay. And then that other 49% will be distributed to the buyers of in that community that want to say, get that 49% from that card. And from there, um, if you would want to say, sell your card or whatever, you own that 51%. So you would then say, sell it for that 51% if you wanted to in that real life circumstance, because you've already diversified that asset. And then once that asset actually changes hands, the NFT should also change hands as well this should all be within a transaction okay what happens if you have a real world seller and then they don't want to t take part in the like they could the go demo. ahead and buy the actual full assets so there okay. will be so there will be say a price determined for whether it's a floor or a ceiling price determined on how much everybody bought into the asset mm -hmm. um that specific uh number had it we have a theory behind it right now, right? So 5X floor or 2X or, or no, 2X below floor or uh, 5X above the floor, right? So we have this theory now, but this is all to be voted within the DAO. And we really want people's input more so than just our interior team and the people that we've spoken to's input on setting these parameters to what exactly that will be. But the theory is, yes, if somebody wanted to say and come and buy out the entire asset, they could then go ahead and try to put a bid for that maximum price or that mm -hmm. automatic sell price, which would be say 5X the floor for theory, just for this conversation. And if they do that, then the transaction will go through and it should all be um, weighted on the actual buy-in price of everybody. So say of that 49%, most people bought in or say, 75% of those uh, people that bought in, they bought in around 100 ADA. So the weighted floor price would be say 500 ADA so that whenever everybody else wants to release the asset, that's kind of the trigger price, gotcha. you know, to have that happen. And that's in the instance of you retaining the 51%. So we are also looking into working with partners that will have um, insured vaults that you could then more so diversify beyond that 51%. And then those insured vaults would hold on to these assets itself. And then we will work something out with these um, insured partners in the future. And when, when he says vaults, it could be uh, even just like um, an auction house itself. Auction or house, it, galleries, um, anything that is actually an insured property that right. has the regulation to actually protect said assets and insure said assets. And it's now kind of we're feeling too, right because in a they're realm. sorry. Go ahead, Will. Uh, this is also in a realm where just our uh, lawyers have a, a very, very vast level of expertise with this type of stuff, like creating different, um, almost like mortgages that act as a alternative to a construction loan, 
where essentially it's just like a bridge loan, but acts differently for people with different alternative financing. Um, we've kind of did something similar to with the uh, housing development um, ecosystem we're creating with uh, that'll be pairing with Opus in the future, where um, we think we can essentially hopefully create something if there isn't already a better option out there. And this, these places kind of like lend this, it's kind of perfect because these places kind of lend themselves to like this kind of marketplace too, where you can go to them and be like, hey, like here's another way of like growing your business too, right? Because they already have the space, the security there for physical objects. And now you guys are coming along and doing like, hey, we could do this in the virtual space as well. Yeah, so exactly. the mutual benefits certainly there. And that's kind of one of the key critical aspects of what we look for when creating a business partnership that's uh, ideally going to be a long term one or more of a long term one. It's uh, really finding a mutual benefit that's continuing all that. And when you really, really, that's why we have Will and Davis on. So we they could help us with all of these strategic partnerships and actually make sure we're working with the right teams. You know, this is what they do for a living. So this is why we have them on board to make sure we're working with all the right teams and all the right people just to be insured, be, you know, r- do right by the community in a sense. Hmm. Yeah, and it's so mu- mutually beneficial if you really think about it, because it's really both sides. Like we could walk in and we could give them things to hold and and then they could go ahead and put their things on chain and put out 49% of it. Exactly. So it, it goes both ways, and it's really, really amazing when it comes to that. We also are exploring the potential of working with framing galleries to have your NFT printed professionally. It's pretty nice. Cool. So are you guys working on the actual, like, uh, let's let's just take the trading cards, for example, the, um, the case for it. Is it going to be, like, tamper-proof so that, mm-hmm. like, let's say since someone will own it, that way they can't just take it out of the case probably, and then work. Let's say they work with another DAO and they're like, oh, I have this same physical object. Like, how do we fight against that kind of thing happening? That, that I believe, would be where one of the um, the partners I mentioned earlier, the company is called Course and Chain, and uh, just in case anyone's curious, uh, they've dealt in uh, a little bit of the same security complexity with the cannabis industry and creating a whole entire separate protocol and programs uh, modeled off the same technology in that sector, but also um, kind of taking from that the same level of uh, security protocols and safety checks and uh, fail safes in place where if one thing is broken, there's three more triggers that all have to be kind of reverted even. And that's just numbers I'm kind of uh, as an example, but uh, it's more of a dynamic system designed in the way the alerts occur. Um, Davis could probably elaborate yes. better on the actual. We're technical. planning on searching for a ultra low power IoT device that will then transmit that information through the internet via low power Bluetooth, low power Wi Fi, and have that connected to a blockchain output oracle to record the event in the case of any tampering or the object physically moving to another location. Wow, that's awesome. So, by the insurance. In layman's so terms. Important. Uh, in layman's terms, you could think about like um, how uh, Apple is using their Apple tag ID tags, um, and then also um, if you ever have seen a um, a magnetic ribbon or a ribbon that gets um, put between on a vending machine, mm-hmm. if that thing is broken, the t- is tampered first. Well, on the inside of that, that actually has um, some. Uh, connections that if those connections are broken, it sends a alarm back. That alarm is what we would be able to send to that Oracle as well. And I think the best way to summarize is we'll probably just do what we always do and find the person that is the best in this area of expertise and bring them into the project and, and find the way to create the best version of this for the open platform. In the event, like let's say the object is in someone's house and there's like a fire and it gets ruined how do the um the other people who got like a part of that fractionalization do they get compensated through an insurance company or what like what are we thinking for that oh chris you're muted 
Sorry, yes, I was muted. Uh, that's what we're currently working on. We're trying to find an insurance provider that will help us facilitate these blockchain transactions and try to insure our actual asset owners in case of these rare incidents of a fire or stolen item or anything like that. Um, we've been getting this question over and over again about yeah. these certain, uh, we, circumstances and insurance is the answer to that. Uh, on our previous um, projects in uh, the past, we've dealt with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners before. Um, so we already kind of have a working relationship with that body and uh, they sure know it's pretty significant interest in at least getting to know more about all of this and learning how they could start to use some of these things to apply to their industry in general. Um, just from an underwriting standpoint and fraud alone, this would probably be able to save um, a fortune. To save them, so. IP, IP, for example, just really countless industries where everyone tries to, especially in business. Um, I mean, I, I, it's, it's unfortunate, but even really egregious mistakes that shouldn't be made are in trade. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just, you know, just think, you uh, avoid a lot of that. Just think uh, data input alone um, across or the indeed, how much data mistake. you have to have put in um, from one person uh, getting the information and then giving it to someone else to actually type into it a, a database. Um, that doesn't really need to happen anymore. You guys are at the forefront of this industry. Do you see like a lot of excitement for this when you talk to these people or is it, do you, th do you, do you, do you see them like being like, like apprehensive about the whole thing or do you think like they know that like this is kind of the future of where everything's going a lot I think of it's a, i think it's a mix at least for us uh, the people that we are contacting um davis here is actually pretty pretty good at uh, discerning who would be the best interested party based on previous business experiences and a lot of other variables where even if they might not already be very interested in it um, it, it's almost like a light bulb click where they, it mm. sparks their interest. And in I think people get excited when you have the best intentions for everyone involved. And if there's a way they can contribute, um, and they see that it, you know, they want to contribute and help out. So that's kind of just what we're trying to convey to everyone. We're getting. Sorry, Chris. You guys planning to go to, yeah, go ahead. What was that? Did, Sorry. Did you have, did you have a thought on that as well? Uh, I was about to input, but we'll kind of mention some of the things I was going to say. So, no worries. Do you guys plan to go to like these like trading card conventions and stuff, and kind of like get your name out there once your product is live and everything? Uh, DSG is actually doing that on our behalf. However, I am planning on attending some card auto events in the future, such as Rare nice. Blue. Yeah, I'll be down here locally at the um, Miami Cardano meetup at this next one and the next ones in the future. Um, that's where I'm based out of locally is Miami. So just trying to tap in more with the local crowd as far as the um, trading cards events. I think Comic-Con and all these type of events for the near future are going to be very exciting, especially with NFTs. I was a part of um, Art Basel down here in Miami, and I really saw how NFTs took that over. And obviously art was that first industry to, you know, kind of be struck by NFTs. So now really when it starts moving into this collectible aspect of it all, I'm uh, starting to get really excited to go to some of these events and like shake some hands of the real collectors that have kind of, you know, set the standards for collection. And now we're just trying to figure out a better, more secure way to handle all their assets. It's exciting. It's, it's beyond exciting to me, like literally so many companies that we speak to and uh like uh, will said that spark that comes to their eyes when they realize that they're one not late but two they could all honestly provide a big service to the industry is really amazing whenever we get those types of conversations and uh get the joy of having them with these teams so uh, because um it's just really exciting to see um people excited to build you know, and I get nothing but that from this space. It's just a bunch of people that are really excited to build and create the future because we all really, I think, have a um, understanding of the field in a sense and how it's really going to benefit our lives in the next, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, whatever it may be for some of these um, smaller, more minute things that we are discussing. But there's certain things that, you know, 
in five years, 10 years, when it comes to the insurance industry, how much of that is actually going to live on blockchain because it's so verifiable and, you know, there is no latency of information, right? So there's just so many use cases that we really see. Um, I believe when we first started discussing this idea, we had seven legitimate industries that we could use case NFTs for. And that's really where we started to say, wow, this is something enormous, you know, because we really saw where it kind of trickled into all these other fields. And um, every time we speak to teams in these fields and kind of give them our insights of what we believe is going to happen and where we think they could help us, we never really get pushback. They're all excited to jump on board and all excited to try to figure out a way to actually push the boundaries of what we're building right now. Cody calls me on almost a daily basis with a new, very, very applicable idea where the only concern <laughs> part is, oh my God, that's going to transform an industry. We probably want to hold off on telling anyone that for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> These are constant conversations we have. We need to keep a lot of things in the bag because um, yeah. it takes a lot to build. You know, yeah, so 100%. in that sense, it's like you can't let all the cats out of the bag. You know, we're really trying to be transparent as possible, but there's uh, definitely certain things that we have to keep close to the chest and um, really try to um, build and get it to market, you know. Yes, yeah, especially if you guys want to be the first to market, it's definitely probably best not to share all your ideas before you get to them. We don't want anyone working on our ideas in parallel. Yeah, like I, I don't think we're necessarily concerned about first to market. I'm personally more concerned about best to market. Mm. Yes, best to market. So exactly, that's well really said. the key. You know, so like uh, another DAO formed NFT platform. Like we're not the first. We're not going to be the last. That's not it. What we really try to uh, do is be different than everybody else and be the best in that market. And that's really what I think we've spent our last year and change working on is figuring out how to be the best in that market. And I really that. I think that comes from trying to somewhat predict where all this is going to be, but also try to make these relationships to make sure that this is where this field is going as well. You know, because we've had these conversations with these teams, they're ready to progress, they're ready to move forward. Now it's just really on the community to come together and actually show that we want something amazing to be built. Yeah, when it comes to the tools, when it comes to the uh, the collectibles, the trading cards, and putting all those things on onto chain. Uh, we are definitely going to be the one of the next things, I believe, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty excited to see what you guys have planned. I mean, especially with the tech getting there, and like, I almost feel like we're at the cusp of almost everything having like embedded chips in it, where you know you start to have like RFID tags and literally everything, and. Um, I mean, th these things are getting so cheap. You, you start to see a future where literally yeah. everything in the real world can be, have a value, yeah. you know, and that value can be yeah. portrayed on chain. Do you yeah, there the are RFID chips that are security. so low power that they can run off of the static electricity from your clothes touching each other. Yeah, yeah. and now we're kiddingly yeah. talking about like futuristic movies where things are buried and they're able to find that life saving right. device. Uh, I, I charge you uh, 15, 15 shells for saying the F bomb. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> you guys remember like uh, Miota or the Internet of Things? Yeah. 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 So, like, that's basically where a lot of this stuff is going. They've already been working on that since what, 2017, 16, I think. So, you know, this is already, I saw this years ago and I was beyond interested just because, like, I understood smart like why does my refrigerator smart like why does it need to <laughs> i will say system right you know but all of these things are already happening these um these chips are already in everything so now right. it's just about making it all interoperable you can make everything from the palm of your hand on your phone because everything has an app nowadays you know so all of this stuff is going to i believe live on chain and i think you know like internet of things they're already ahead of the game when it comes to like that specific part of it but that's just one part it's just like oracle itself that's just another part all of these things have to communicate with each other to actually make the big thing work together so that's really my thing here is like the interoperability of all of these things in the future is going to be amazing and right now it's just our job to try to figure that part out and how to make all these things communicate and work together yeah, yeah. i would have to say that we do have to uh think a little bit morally and uh, make sure that we don't track too much as well yeah true 
we got to think that's about. something we're certainly can concerned about when it comes to the moral yeah. hazards of everything uh, it, and the quantified impact. Yeah, so we're even being able to have a little bit of control over your own data, which we don't have now. Even Facebook, if you were to go and delete your Facebook profile, some company has the information somewhere, unfortunately. So do you foresee Cardano eventually having some type of privacy layer built in it so that it, the future doesn't get too weird or where, where do you guys see that? Because I think there's definitely like some use cases, whereas like, you don't like, you don't want everybody to see everything you do. Like I know personally, like with my NFTs and stuff like that, like uh JPEG stores creating profiles and like where you can all put all your information on there on the chain. And it, it gets weird. Cause like, you'll see people on Twitter start to talk about someone's NFTs that they own. And it's like, sometimes you don't want people knowing what moves you're making or like, yeah. I will say that um, that it's it it gets com it gets kind of convoluted when it comes to all that. Um, uh, it's it's hard to to gauge what you want to have out there and what you want to be private and mm -hmm. where do we draw the line is is the hard. I try to always you know, in um, uncertain areas like this. Just use the good old logic uh, my grandmother taught me. Don't ever do anything that I wouldn't uh, feel comfortable with her seeing or with my granddaughter seeing. Not that I have a granddaughter, but uh, I think the idea of that concept in general and kind of trying to be, even in your private life, as uh, willing to be transparent of your actions and stand behind them from a moral standpoint as possible. So for me, as foods shouldn't be on chain, is what you're saying. <laughs> for, for me, as far as like security, like, I don't think it'll be a specific security layer. Layer, I think it will be more so like a did. So a did when you're actually sharing that information, like they don't mm. know exactly who you are, but they can right. see the information within the transaction, right? So like once we actually get to that level of blockchain that we do actually have dids. I really think that um, security protocol wouldn't be say necessary. It would be more so if you want to share your information at that point, then yeah. you do. So it would be more along the lines of uh, um, a little bit of personal information ownership. Um, you Very and having opt in. Saying opt in. your date, huh? And yeah, and you can opt in, opt, in, opt out. Yeah, exactly. Yes, absolutely. You can opt out. You can tell them, yes, I want them to know who I am. No, I don't want them to know who I am. But um, from my understanding of what dids and where they're kind of going is like you could go and get a quote from an insurance provider. They can see your medical history. They can see all this information that you allow them to see, but they don't know your name. So they can't backtrack you or whatever and make some type of claims or clause or whatever it is. They just see basic information on a data spreadsheet. So when we come to that part of the blockchain and actually interacting with um, contracts and all that, we're really going to get to a point that you're not going to need to see that opposing person on the opposite side of that transaction, especially when we're actually transacting with did wallets or however it is we actually implement this. Yeah, so we're also planning on working with third party custodians, just because like Charles Hoskinson said, not everyone can be their own bank. It's a lot of responsibility. You need to take care of your passwords, your recovery phrases, cold storage, and just be really careful with your internet hygiene. So yeah. it's always going to be an option to use a custodian rather than holding your own assets. But we like to leave it open for the customer to decide. Yeah, Mike, you wanna might want to hide some of those NFTs. Some of them are pretty embarrassing. So, <laughs> I know I have a couple of embarrassing ones for sure. I only <laughs> three days of Cardano, so you don't even want to see some of those. Wait, well, you're talking to? Yeah. Sorry, you go gotta remember, I was gonna say you gotta remember you're talking to uh, someone who to put up some of the first uh, NFTs on Cardano over here. So <laughs> it's the tree of life, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm into the tree of life on um, April 10th of last year. So that was uh, within the first month and a half. That was like one of the first, um, what is it, like um, animated animated NFTs on Cardano. Some claim that it's the first. I think there was one or two people before my animated NFT on there for sure. I, I know for a fact that I was shopping around for a couple of animated NFTs before I dropped so. I want to give those people credit, but <laughs> yeah, no, I've been in the space um, for since late 2017 is when I first got into the space originally, but like actually really into Cardano was like 
2019 and then i started with the minting right after space like i missed space but it's about like a day and then like i was like hooked i was like all right cardano has nfts what let me drop all my cardano into nfts as like as soon as i find out how you know and literally like a day or two later i found out about like finger monsters and c bits and i was minting all that very early, early on yas and you know all the early cats i was definitely involved with them and you know trying to figure it out like everybody else <laughs> Um, so for like these these uh, real world assets, are they gonna be portrayed on chain and like some type of three D model? Like, do you how do you guys see this playing with like the metaverse too? Like, so would, are we gonna have like portrayals of things where you can have like a, a real world art would, exhibit where you could show off yeah. your everything that you own? Yeah. So, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So when it comes to like a trading card, for instance, they're gonna be like high res. Uh, high resolution scans that will give you the exact like so grading for instance in cards it's it's um it's very important so if a corner is bent or there's any type of discrepancy you you want to see that on the actual nft itself so there's going to be high resolution scans of the physical assets mm -hmm. themselves just to represent that actual physical asset itself really wow. Um, and when it comes to like, say, one of one art or something like that, that's dependent on the artist, whether they really want to say make a 3D version or a right. multi or a um, multiverse version or whatever it is um, and do that type of artwork. But when it comes to like actual physical assets right now, the idea is mostly the high resolution scan just so you can get a true representative of what you actually own. Gotcha. And uh, so just to clarify on that, I guess in our minds, we're looking at the fractionalization aspect of nfts to be like essentially a stock offering would be for a normal company where we're looking at it almost as long as we stay away from fractionalization of the stock uh share in the sense of that's where the volatility really gets in where there's people that are actually the shareholders who don't have a direct say and it's all based on the the general perceived feelings of their shareholders by a larger entity kind of similar in how to robin hood essentially acted as like an un unregulated hedge fund. Um, and, and that's where we're trying to really make sure that this doesn't get to that and making sure that the shareholders that have a say in it are actively involved in it and that direct one-to-one, -one, know your customer, all the compliance things involved. And we also feel like in general, just taking that same approach, there's so many different things that are currently in need of a best case scenario or best uh, sorry best use case on how to proceed for certain things i think and i think as we continue to per put the best way of doing things out there at least what we think is the most ethical and morally safe grounded way whether it's most profitable or not people will start to build off of it the right way um it seems like there's a lot of trepidation across the industry of what's the best direction to move forward and some of these what could be massively beneficial areas like the traditional assets so one of the biggest things is underrating it so for example to transition more complex financial uh transfers of assets like uh it, payment of a uh, loan from one organization to another they need to be able to underwrite that transaction for example something that city bank when they accidentally sent back uh 900 million dollars to a hedge fund it was perceived because there's a law that says if you weren't aware that that was an accident, you're allowed to keep the money essentially if it was believed to be intentional. So they had to prove through uh, somewhat comical text messages about the individual who accidentally hit it. One of them was, uh, hey honey, sorry, I accidentally sent someone $900 million by accident. How was your day? <laughs> and it was <laughs> internal text messaging. But to me, for something like that to be the justification for the outcome of a court case, says there's probably something about the initial structuring of the walls in the first place that needs to be reworked. Mm -hmm. And we feel like this could really kind of be that, you know, grounded way of doing so because it seems as though from all accounts this would have that validation and authentication they would need to really be able to underwrite and ensure some of these larger financial transactions that are still currently done on like 1980s versions operating software. Yeah, leveraging the use of smart contracts for conflict resolution. And even in uh, other countries as well, where everything can be digitalized and automated, we're pretty heavily involved in West Africa from an advisory standpoint and some other conflict resolution areas. So we have some pretty strong intentions on bringing a lot of this over there. It's very well adapted to digital currency 
as a means of payment and uh, you know asset holdings and you know world pays been around there since really well before the smartphone ever existed and uh, that's been unanimous across the whole continent so we're hoping just because that easy adaption of the fintech technologies and its quick authority um, advancement in the industry as a whole over there it shouldn't take too long to really start to gain some traction and find rural world applications such as power monitoring usage uh, choosing when to kill all the breakers so you don't blow the whole system microgrids are gaining a lot of traction over there um, having a permanent power supply is more important than running water because you need to power your biometric security entry to your universities for safety reasons, not necessarily, you know, carrying a 12 students share one floor. So finding different ways this can act as an individual, whether you don't have to worry about the emotional biases or political corruption that could come. And even West Africa's innovation with technology such as being able to send bitcoin over a text message yeah it's pretty cool how do you guys see uh bitcoin playing into this do you do you see bitcoin i think being bitcoin for the, the moment well? is sort of the staple of the market bitcoin is directly correlated to all of the other crypto currencies and blockchains at the moment but there might be a decoupling in the future as more and more use cases come out of the third this and might, fourth generation blockchains. This <laughs> might start a bit of a war, and I don't mean it that way, but like Erie Railroad. If anyone's <laughs> familiar with that reference. <laughs> what was the reference? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Ever familiar with that I think I would be the only one other than Bule or Davis. Eer <laughs> the Erie Railroad incident? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not with, in the Gotcha. It's where Van, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt pretty much made his, or almost lost his fortune, rather, I guess you'd say. Uh, Jay Gould, it was an incident where they kind of, uh, at one point, were quite literally printing fake stock uh, to try to inflate the value of the railroad stock. And it was like where the first government cracked down and realizing that the stock market needed to be heavily regulated. Mm. And how does that how does that connect to Bitcoin? I'm sorry. It, it just seems like that was kind of the surge of all of it. And it was the first one to really kind of take off and yeah. possibly an inflationary way where the FOMO and everything else, I think, played a huge effect where if there was already regulation in place, I don't believe that would have been. Uh -oh. Rugged. Mic drop. Rugged. Rugged us. <laughs> as far as Bitcoin, Bitcoin is definitely um, king, you know, is definitely the maker of the market in a sense and um i do truly believe it as digital gold and i do believe it will begin to eat up a lot more of um gold's market caps in the next couple of years um not even to mention so many other types of investments will funnel into bitcoin or be you know um, valued in bitcoin so that will give it its own market cap like once we actually start to see even more countries investing into it you know so i definitely am a believer in bitcoin but bitcoin is digital gold it's not really a great currency it's not really useful for much other than storing your value you know and that's even um an argument to some people calling it a store of value when it's so volatile i mean when you look at the chart yes you definitely store your value and it goes up and to the right only right <laughs> but you know with that volatility and everything that the market has kind of had to um go through with bitcoin i think it was the perfect um structure like the yeah, perfect even the fact that in a you sense. know considering there will only ever be 21 million bitcoin at this point maybe 18.5 a lot of them have gotten lost but yeah. the fact that 12 trillion dollars and 32 million tons of gold was recently discovered in uganda that might really affect that market too exactly that's literally one of the points that I was trying to get to was like, literally, they just found all this gold. And just like you see, gold could technically be inflationary when they find a big hoard of it just in a random country somewhere. Right. So you're not going to just find a big random hoard of Bitcoin. And if you yeah. do, it just betters the network, you know, because there's only a finite amount. So you can all, find more gold in space to asteroid mining. That'll eventually be a thing in the future. So it might just be worthless. And the value of gold will be for its use in electronics or it's cooling properties anything else yeah but i think michael saylor definitely says it right when he says this is the most optimal use of our energy that we have ever invented 
You know, I really truly believe that this network that we've created with Bitcoin is um, here to stay. And I think it's proven itself already. And I think it's um, really start starting to make a difference in this world after the, what, 13 years it's been around? 14 almost now? Yeah. So how do you, like, how does somebody, like, look at this space when they're talking about something like that, where it's like, do you, how do you diversify your portfolio where you have a certain amount where you're like, this is cold storage, like, this is value I put away under... Please, I'm a DJ. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you can't ask us those questions. <laughs> no, honestly, yes, I can't. I came from being a DJ. Don't get me wrong, but I definitely diversify. Like I have my properties, and when it comes to crypto per se, exactly, you do want to retain safe. So, like that's why I love Cardano. You could just yeah, it stake it and you earn. So right. the you more the better it is one for the blockchain but better for yourself as well because you just get to stake and accumulate over time more and more and it's obviously if you believe in the blockchain or the project itself like it's going to only benefit you in the long term so when you're looking at anything that you could stake to earn um as long as there is a strong blockchain backing it with actual transactions and use case i see it being um useful for the future in a sense you know the opposite kind of comes with bitcoin because that same user interoperability and that um say scalability of that network isn't as large as other blockchains so that's why i do believe it's more so of a digital gold and it's like if you really just want your this money to sit on the sidelines and not really be in a lot of active or risky quote unquote investments um then you put whatever comfortable amount that is for you into bitcoin Everything else is more speculative, but with the more education that you earn or learn with uh, educating yourself on each of these different blockchains and their use cases, I really feel like you could start to, your, your portfolio will kind of make itself. You know, I'm not gonna come on here and give financial advice, say, hey, yeah, you yeah. need X or that or whatever, but yeah. everybody has their risky portion, everybody has their sub risky portion, and then everybody has the portion that's in Bitcoin, for instance, or Cardano or Ethereum, whichever one you truly believe in. Personally, yeah. I'm not really a holder of Bitcoin. I believe in Cardano's ability to grow and scale in the near future more so than Bitcoin. Um, I'm not wealthy enough to just sit my money in Bitcoin, to be quite honest. You know, so like that's really my own thing against it is I am not a whale like that yet. So it doesn't benefit me to just leave it there and just watch it um, sit in Bitcoin or whatever. But as opposed to Cardano, I can let it sit there and accumulate while I stake it, you know? And then every time I look at my wallet, every five days, I have a little bit more Cardano coming my way, you know? And then over time, I obviously believe in the project. So it don't, does nothing but benefit you. And really, I think this will start to take away things from bonds things from indexes that, you know, the more traditional finance guys that look for these small yields, the blockchain's now providing this with even more when you actually look at the number difference at the end of the year, because that 5% is just on your ADA. That's your ADA amount, not the dollar amount. The ADA went up 100%, shit, you went 500%, you know, whatever it may be at, by the end of the year. So that's the big difference that I see this, um, This community of cryptocurrency in itself generating actual usable products that is going to start helping bridge the traditional finance guys and the regular users of the internet into crypto. I really feel crypto is starting to consume the internet. We started to see it with the NFTs or watching it go into gaming. Once there's actual really fun crypto gaming platform, how many users will that actually attract? How much money will that actually attract to the blockchain? And then how much of that will actually be retained within the blockchain when it's a fun game? Yeah. You know, how many people do I know play Fortnite and Call of Duty and all these games and spend so much money on skins? Yeah, but, yeah. So if you think about yeah. it, it's like um, these the younger people right now, they're not thinking about, oh, I'm going to put my money into a house. I'm going to put my money into... Um, uh, a stock or I'm going to go ahead and go with Charles Schwab down and, and make sure I'm good for the future. They're not thinking that way. They're thinking I'm going to put my money into what a uh, space book, put my money into yeah. a board, eight. put my money into something that's going to double my money now. And then I can take that money and do that again and still have money left over. Yeah. That's, what, I, that's how all these guys are thinking. And it's not, it's not, um, it's not bad 
per se by any means, but it's 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 all leading into it just being another way of investing, another way of doing this. And I think that it's uh it's again, I think it's amazing to me. Yeah. And that's why that I we start to get into it and we start to really think about how much this can truly change. It's uh it's just keeps going. It's keeps yeah. going. I'm a PC gamer myself, so that's actually where all of this came from. Vitalik Buterin was playing World of Warcraft, and he lost some of his items because there was no way to verify his transactions and all of his upgrades. So that's how we got Ethereum. And some of the future application I see with this is leveraging IPFS, the interplanetary file system, to keep the games basically on a distributed server framework and have updates and any assets that you purchase you're able to hold on to them. So if the servers were to go offline from the devs, you'd still be able to play the game and it wouldn't be a waste of $60 or whatever you pay for it. This is an uh, interesting, um, sorry, Eric, go ahead. I just gonna have one, one last point. Uh, it's interesting, like even if you go on Reddit or something, people who are uh, even into crypto or whatever, they still like kind of shit on NFTs for some reason. Like they don't think they're like, legit um but you then you see like all these corporations are buying into nfts and they want like a piece of that so it's kind of like it's interesting that like the so, dichotomy between those two things those guys, those guys who are shitting on all those don't know anything what they see is memes they see stick figures being sold for millions of dollars they see the board apes being sold for millions of dollars like they that that's all they see and they think that that's all it is they just I don't, don't what I really see is people not understanding things. So it's just like Cardano, the same people that shit on Cardano, right? They're going to talk all the smack. Oh, Cardano has no use case, whatever, blah, blah, blah. We take forever to build, right? It, it's the same mindset I take of that user to the same user that says, oh, I like crypto, but not NFTs. You're just not doing your homework. You're not yeah. actually doing the research. Because if you were and you actually did the time, the 100 hours or whatever it is to actually understand the thing, you know, you, there is no way you can't see the bright future of these applications, you know. So it's like literally every extra 10 hours I do of homework, it's like, oh, bam, another use case, another use case. Like it just I, keeps popping up, you know. So yeah. it's really that same mindset of those characters that one say, oh, no, I don't like this part of crypto or nfts or whatever because they're going to come around to it when everybody else is using it mm. you know and yeah. it happen it's That's just true. time and like bitcoin people didn't trust bitcoin at first now everybody has some bitcoin yeah so, gary, gary and, says it said it the best what he said about the first thing with the the beginning of the internet and mm -hmm. just like you he said um in the beginning of the internet people didn't think that you were going to be able able to even get a piece of mail sent to you electronically yep. yeah just, just email just think about that just email yeah. it, that that was possible that's how we set up this interview today was via email so it's like let's talk about nfts in another 20 30 years and you know have that <laughs> yeah. just just on remember, we'll, we'll never need more than 64 kilobits of ram and according <laughs> to i BM in the beginning, I think we might need 15 computers in the entire tops, world. Tops, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I was now, thinking now about I have, uh, I have in front of me right now, like right yeah. now. Yeah, that's, that's it. this is three area, in front of me. Yeah. Um, so, like for example, I just wanted to like a thought experiment. Like, okay, so Eric has his Honus Wagner card, right? It's worth let's say six million dollars. This is a physical card. It's worth six million dollars. Once you guys tie that to that NFT and it starts to become fractionalized, obviously, like, because this will be the first time this is being done on Cardano and it's like, there's going to be hype around it, right? So there's going to be some price appreciation. How how does the, how does the virtual price or like tie into like the physical asset, like as, as like there's this I, crazy I amount of volatility? That. Yeah. So we're planning on mostly having it one-to-one -one for physical collector's items like that. We'll be mm -hmm. gathering the data from auctioneers and other sources to make sure that you know the price just doesn't go absolutely crazy and has absolutely no correlation well yes we're going to get that information from auctioneers and oracles and all that but if people want to say spend 10 million dollars on something that's worth 20 dollars, people are right. going to do it 
market determines yeah. value yeah, and that happens right. naturally too. over time. So it's really determinant on what people are willing to pay for it. If they see the historical value of it being the first um, physical trading card on Cardano and that's what they want to invest in for, that might be it. It might not be, but you know, there's the market gives value to whatever the, right. the how, asset, how I look at it clearest answer of anything whether it's bitcoin whether it's a traded asset on our platform to the in the future you know the market gives value yeah how so I whatever the value is at the end of the day is where it will lie due to the people that are moving within and out of that asset yeah i was going to just say um how i look at it is if you just look at ebay um as the yep. bid system um it's always bids are going to go up no matter what right. and but at the same time we're going to try to keep it to people knowing as much information about that that said product that said asset so they know where around what they should be paying for it right no it's exciting because it gives like these real world assets like so much more value it opens up like a whole new world right and it's like i mean once you guys start marketing that and being like these assets like also have an nft that's tradable that you can fractionalize that like it's almost a different way even for homes where it's like it gives you another option than just like refinancing the house you know what i mean like exactly. it's so interesting like what what kind of possibilities can open up from the, yeah from just the yeah, another system. application i can see would be partnering with a small art museum and they really don't have much revenue to operate yearly so they could say fractionalize the art that they have and people could invest in their art and their business and they won't have to rely as much on donations yeah so you can even think about when if um different uh companies decide that they want to start giving away some ip rights with something like this think about that if a bigger company were to say oh well you can now buy this nft and you can go ahead and also start to print nike shirts just saying like that's right. not something but you know what i mean that's that's a whole nother thing that could open up branding and things of big companies to smaller people and, and vice versa well, back to the real estate thing that you just mentioned. So it's like, you know, any deed or any actual like rental property could be done via NFTs because NFTs, most people look at it as a JPEG, but in reality, it's just a smart contract. So it's a contract set up from owner to renter. So in that case, that transaction could be done very seamlessly, whether, you know, it's on Airbnb, whether it's a month to month, whether whatever transaction it needs to fit. Um, we really see the smart contract side of things and we really think that um, uh, like what Will was saying earlier with all the um, underwriting work with insurance and real estate and all these types of things. This is where I believe NFTs start to make certain jobs obsolete and where this is where a lot of that market share will be untapped early on, especially by people that don't really understand the power and the use case of NFTs to displace certain jobs like underwriting or you know um just manage uh management of properties or assets and all of these things you know these could all be tied into baskets of nfts if you own a hundred uh real estate properties right and then fractionalize that basket of nfts just like uh, reit like there's so many different uh contracts that you could form and reality uh nft is just a buzzword and smart contract is the real thing that we're working with here so any type of contract will be on the blockchain and we are now basically focusing on trying to figure out how to be the ones that deliver these um utilities to the actual communities whether it's that insurance part whether it's the deed part whether you know anything that just has to be verified and it is a smart contract uh, i believe we um one will have a share of that market but two we're working very hard to be early within all of these markets that will be untapped for a very long time yeah and helping to facilitate person to person facilitate tr person to person transactions rather than person to bank to person to intermediary mm. less it fees on both too much sense yeah. thank you <laughs> thank you it's like, it's like it's like when you guys talk about this stuff it almost seems like why aren't people doing this and why is this a part of the system already so the fact that you guys are here now it's like it makes me so excited and like to see what you guys start building and like i can't i'm so excited to see what you guys have for the future and i i'd love to have you guys on again in like six months just to see where you guys are at and get an update on everything yeah i think that'll be no. very beneficial to the community to all of us honestly uh, 
constant update with all of us, yeah. you know, as we build. I think that'll be a great series for this, you know. Yeah, I see that yeah. working out for sure. It, you could tell how how interested we are in this stuff. This is like by far our longest interview. So, oh, nice. <laughs> we appreciate no, your time. Yeah. Yes. We're I've been into this for four years, so I'm just getting all of my thoughts <laughs> out. But it's great that now I can actually apply them instead of just, you know, passively buying cryptocurrencies and staking and mining. This is entirely different. Right. This is why it's like uh, the Bitcoin thing is cool. We can store your value on chain. But it's like when you come into a system like Cardano and it opens up these these possibilities where you guys are doing this with smart contracts and having this metadata with like, you know, different um you know, you could have your house on, you know, it's just, it's, it, the possibilities are endless. And it's like, I could see why I'm surprised you guys sleep at all at this point. It's just like, yeah. you guys wanna, you oh, guys I already don't sleep. I, I yeah. work for a strategic advisory firm. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sleep is uh, when we're dead, but uh, yeah, yeah, we've been working on this for a little over a year. And um, this is why we have so many ideas towards this, in all honesty. Like, this has all just been a building block after building block after building block. You know, like I said, the more information we receive as a team and the more education we do as a team and just speaking with um, other teams outside of this industry, we really understand how big this is and how big NFT technology is and where its place will be in the world in the next few years. And this is why we've just buckled down and just decided to focus on NFTs and trying to create something useful for Cardano and for the community. Let's leave it there, guys. That was amazing. I'm so excited to see what you guys are building. And um, we'll have all the info in the, uh, the, the comment section. So, yeah, the description. So, amazing. The Opus Dow team, guys. Go yeah. to NFTs. Yeah. <laughs> right on, guys. Thank you so much for having us on. I know Will cut out here at the end. I'm sure he's going to thank you as well. Um, yeah, thank you for having us on. And I'm looking forward to that uh, interview in the, the next few months. Yeah, of course. Sounds good. Door will be open. Have a good night, guys. guys. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for uh, having us, and um, can't wait to see you guys uh, in the community here soon, and we we'll get to see what we're actually doing we'll there, doing and getting it going. Yeah. All right. Appreciate Grabbing it. Some. Right, stay chill. <laughs> oh, always. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Have a good Later. night, guys. You too. Good Peace. Night.